Okay, so let me start from a basic question. What is economics? There are many definitions and many right answers for this question. The traditional and formal definition is about scarcity, is about people's behavior, individual's behavior, given scarce resources. But there are other definitions, and many definitions are correct. From the point of view of long-run development, to me, economics is about our behavior, our existence, and our evolution. For some people, economics is labor. But labor economics is only one field in economics. For other people, economics is money. But money and the financial market is also one small field of economics. So, in general, economics is our behavior in any aspect of life. And today, we see an overlap between economics and many other disciplines, such as psychology, political sciences, anthropology, and even law. So once again, economics is about our life. And if it is about our life, it's important to understand the role of women in this life from the point of view of economics. So let me just discuss few issues related to women in economics. Why do we need to discuss women in specific? Because women are different from men, not only biologically, but we learned that in production they differ. There are different factors of production, different labor. Women may have different preferences. And thus, they may have different behavior. So why this is important? This is important, for example, for legislations. If women have different preferences, then when women decide, they may legislate different laws. And it's important to understand differences across countries in terms of women's attitude, women's rights, etc., etc. Another important topic is about development and women empowerment. Does development causes, cause more empowerment for women or the other way around. If we empower women, we may observe more development. We observe as well that in some societies, women occupy specific occupations. Why this is the case? So, these are few interesting topics about women in economics. But today's lecture is about household choice. So we imagine a world, or we describe the world, where there is a husband and wife, a man and a woman forming a household. So the first question to ask is there a market for that, which we call a marriage market? So, 
we decide at a certain point in time to marry. Maybe there are specific characteristics by which we choose our spouse. These specific characteristics may be driven by religion, geography, age, and other characteristics. And as a producers, if you think of two producers competing to sell some goods, we may be competing to marry the same person. So there might be a market that mimics any other markets. But this is market for marriage. Then we form a household. What type of household? Marriage is one type. A one-parent household is another type. Cohabitation, where people do not marry but just live together, is a third type. And we may observe in the future other types of households. Why do we choose one specific type, not the other? And who marry whom? Is it random? Or we choose a specific characteristics in our spouse? How do we take decisions? Let's think of a married couples. How do they make decisions? Do they agree on everything? Do they cooperate? Or they don't? And these are the types of problems that we try to think about when studying decisions made by households. This is not working. So let me discuss the main choices made inside the household. A household is like a factory. We produce many things inside this household. So we need to decide how to allocate these resources between the couple, the husband and wife. The couple decides on labor. How much labor should the wife supply and the husband? Do we decide to send our kids to work? How many kids we would like to have? How much education we would like to invest in our children? These are examples of choices made inside the household. But the interesting point I would like to make here that fertility or the number of kids is an economic choice or at least is affected by economic considerations. What characterizes an economic choice is some preferences that we would like to get a specific good, some quantity of a specific good, and having prices, and then budget to purchase this good. Do we love to have kids? It seems that the answer is yes then why we don't choose large number of kids, 20, 30, 40? 
Biologically, we can give birth to a child every year or, ten or nine months. It seems that there is a cost. And the cost dictates our choice. So the focus of this lecture will be on women choices or household choices with regard to the number of kids, female labor supply, and children's education, and the relationship between these choices and development in general. Looking at the evidence from more than a hundred of years, we learned that income or education and fertility, the number of kids, are negatively correlated. We observed that when comparing between countries. So we observe that in richer countries or more educated countries, fertility is lower. This is also true within countries over time. As economies develop and become more educated and richer, fertility declines. This is also true across individuals. We observed during the 20th century that on average, when we look at richer individual, we see that they chose fewer kids. And also across different cohorts. In simple figure, we observe something like this when comparing different women with different levels of education. What you see here is the years of schoolings of mothers. Less than high school, high school, some college, bachelor degree, master degree, and above. So for this cohort born between 1946 and 1950, the relationship is clear, negative. Not only that, look at the difference. 2.5 children for the lowest educational group, 1.4 for the highest educational group. This has been true for more than a century. But what is the explanation for that? In economics, we write theories. We write mathematical models to understand our behavior. And this is a behavior. The behavior is that more educated women choose fewer kids fewer number of kids. Why this is the case? So let me describe to you, in words, the theoretical model from which we can learn why this is the behavior. So we have women. They have the same time endowment. So, if all we need to raise kids and to do other things to consume is time, we don't have poor and rich. We all have the same time in down. We all have 24 hours a day. So these women differ in their education or in their income. So they form a household. 
they work, they choose only two things, consumption and number of kids. In reality, we, purch we purchase food, cars, houses, and many other things. For the theory, this is all consumption. And we are trying to understand how different people make choices over two distinct goods, consumption and number of kids. Now, since more educated women have higher income, meaning they can get more consumption, for them it is more expensive to raise kids. Because when we want to devote time for kids, we are declining work and consumption. So this theoretical tool tells us that for rich women or more educated women, children are more expensive. If they are more expensive, we choose less of any good with a higher price. So it's about prices. So this relationship that I just mentioned has been there for more than a hundred of years because with development, kids become more and more expensive. Or if we compare different individuals, the richer the individual is, the larger is the price of the kid, and therefore, we choose less. But then we calculated, me and my co-author, another measure of fertility. Using US data, the same data, but for the years 2001 to 2011. And we realized that after more than 100 years, the pattern has changed. What was declining all the time, now it is V or U shape. Specifically, Women with master degree and above have more kids than bachelor degree, who have more kids than some college. And this is a big news. And you will see throughout the lecture why this is important. First, it's important per se that the relationship has changed and today educated women are choosing larger families. To verify whether this is just due to some biases in our measure or this is something real in the data, we used another measure. And I don't want to get into the technicality of these measures. But using another measure of fertility, we get a similar pattern. Not exactly, but the idea that educated women have more kids is still there. So, few questions we would like to answer. First, is this new? And second, what explain this pattern? And what is the main driver behind the change in the relationship? So to answer the question whether this is new, we can calculate the same measure for previous years. What I showed you earlier, from 2000 to 2011. Here you have the same figure for 
three years, 1980, it has been declining as we knew. 1990, it started to flatten here. And 2000, a slight increase. And what we saw using data from 2000 to 2011 is a strict U-shape. So we see something evolving here. We look at another measure to make sure that this change is real. The disadvantage of this completed fertility rate is that it looks at the past, but still we can see something. What you have here is different cohorts. If you can see here from 1946 to 50, then 51 to 55, 56 to 60, 60 to 64, and then 64 to 68. And there is a clear pattern. The clear pattern is that fertility among the less educated is declining, fertility among the very educated women is increasing, and the relationship is becoming flat. So, this is a new evidence, and we would like to understand why it is happening. One hypothesis could be that these educated women are working less today. So we have time, and we can allocate our time for raising kids or participating in the labor market, working. If we choose to have more kids, then it may be the case that we work less as women. This is one hypothesis. But another hypothesis is that today, in the modern life, partners, men, help in raising kids. So maybe partners are substituting their wives in raising kids. This is another hypothesis. The marriage market could be a third hypothesis. Imagine that more educated women are more successful in preserving their marriage. As a result, more educated women may have more kids just because of the success of their marriage. This is a third hypothesis. Medical technology could be a fourth hypothesis. Maybe in the past, women couldn't give birth at older ages, above 40, 45. And today we have the medical technology that allows women to give birth at older ages. And the last hypothesis, and this is our theory that we advance in our research, is called marketization or outsourcing. And this is simply to outsource part of what we produce at home to the market. Instead of raising our kids by ourselves, we can hire a nanny. Instead of cleaning our house by ourselves, we can hire a housekeeper. And we can get help, we can buy help from the market and free our time for other things. So let me now extend the model, the theory I described earlier. Again, women have, all women have the same time endowment, 
the same time resources? They differ in their education or income? Now, again, each woman forms a household, works, chooses consumption, but now, in addition to the number of kids, these women choose how much education to invest in their children. So now, it's not only choice with regard to the number of kids, but their level of education. So, education is provided in schools, but raising kids require mother's time. For that reason, education is getting relatively cheaper as parents' income increases. Let's compare two women, highly educated and less educated. They have the same time. But the highly educated, the rich women, can afford more education. And therefore, this woman will invest more in her children's education, and as a result, they will choose fewer kids. So now we have two explanations for why, for more educated women, we observed during the 20th century fewer kids, lower fertility. One explanation is the value of their time. Kids are expensive for them. The second explanation, they want to invest more in the education of their kids. Both reasons can explain the negative relationship that we observe during the 20th century. Now, okay. Let's introduce another channel. What if these women have the opportunity to outsource, to hire a nanny and a housekeeper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Raising children becomes less expensive. Now, what if the reality is such that if we want to give more education to our kids, although it is in school, we need to spend more time helping our kids. Then, outsourcing allows women to first develop their careers and work more, have more children, invest more in children's education, this means that market is, prov is providing more time for rich parents. Moreover, rich mothers spend more time with their children to educate them. This is a result of a theory. This is a result of a theoretical model which is consistent with what we see in reality, with the data. Just to give you a picture that this is what the model produced, the numbers are not important because what is important here is the qualitative result and not the quantities. About the quantities, I will talk later. So here, if you compare women with different level of education, fertility is U-shape as in the data. If we look at children's education, it is positively correlated. Highly educated mother invest more in their children's education. 
the time spent on children also increases with mother's education. And labor supply, according to the theory, increases with women's education. So, highly educated women provide each of their children with more education. They have larger families than women with intermediate level of education. They allocate less time to child raising and to home production and more time for educating their kids. They work more. This is possible because they buy more babysitting and housekeeping services. So, to make this long story very short, we all have the same time endowment. But when we can outsource, marketize, the rich can have more time. So the question, why we haven't seen this pattern in the past? Actually, babysitting and housekeeping services were available before the 2000s. This is not new, only for today. And women did purchase them. When this relationship was negative during the 20th century, why we observe this new shape, this new pattern only after the 2000s? So what has changed over time? The theory tells us that it's all about the cost of childcare. This is what the model taught us. So we go to the data. The model taught us that for highly educated women, childcare has become cheap to the extent they could purchase a lot of childcare, free their time, raise many kids, and invest their time in the labor market and educating their kids. So here we look at the data and we look at the ratio of the childcare cost relative to women's wage for the five educational group. The first group is the less than high school. What we see over time is that childcare is becoming more and more expensive. This is also true for high school graduate. This is slightly true for some college, but it is declining for bachelor degree women and master and above degree women. <laughs> so the question, does this play a role in the emergence of the U-shaped pattern, or more specifically, that today, highly educated women or rich women have more kids than women with intermediate levels of education. Specifically, looking at the relative cost, it has increased by 33% for women with no high school. It has increased by 16% for women with high school degree, and an increase of 5% for women with some college, but a decline of 9% for women with college degree and a decline of 16% for women with advanced degree. So, we try to analyze 
the impact of child care cost on the probability for a woman to give birth. Assuming that the impact is similar across all educational group, or in other words, looking at the average impact, we find that a 1% decrease in the relative cost of childcare increases the average probability of giving birth by three percentage points. But if we allow a differential effect, if we assume that it may be affecting different women differently, we find that here, for the first three groups, a 1% decrease in the relative cost of childcare increases average probability by two percentage point. But for the bachelor's degree, a 1% decrease in the relative cost of childcare increases the average prob probability of giving birth by three and a half percentage point and by five percentage point for the advanced, women with advanced degree. Which means that this reduction in the childcare cost was more beneficial for more educated women in terms of their ability to have larger families. Then we ask the following question. What if this relative cost hasn't changed? Okay? We observed that this relative cost changed from 1983 to 2011. It has increased for some group, declined for other group. Let us take this cost to its value back in 83. What would we get? What would have been the case? And this is what we call the counterfactual fertility, the black one. So as you can see, this is the actual data, and this is the hypothetical data assuming that childcare didn't change. And this exercise shows that a larger part, a major part of the emergence of this new pattern was driven by the reduction in the childcare cost for highly educated women. So what about a direct evidence? Did these women purchase more hours of childcare? We looked at this specific data. We have here the same five educational group of mothers, and here we have paid childcare hours. Two things. It is increasing. So it has been always the case that the higher the education of the mother, the higher is the purchase of childcare. But not only that. Comparing 1990, the dashed line, with the solid line 2008, we observe that these highly educated women increased their purchase of childcare, which is consistent with the theory that what lies behind the emergence of this new pattern is more purchase of childcare and freeing women's time. And once again, this time was allocated for more labor supply and more investment in children's education.
So what about the other hypothesis? We said that it may be the case that highly educated women are having more kids on the expense of their labor supply. They work less. We don't see it in the data. What we see in the data, the more educated the women is, the higher is the labor supply. And this is true not only for all women. This figure is mothers to newborns. Even for mothers to newborns, the relationship is positive. The more education a woman has, the larger is her labor supply. She works more. So, we reject this hypothesis. And it is interesting to see the two patterns together. This relationship, the negative relationship between fertility and labor supply, stopped during the 2000s for highly educated women. These highly educated women are having larger families and at the same time they are working more. And this is because of the market that provides these women with more time by outsourcing child rearing. What about partners? Modern families, fathers help. So this is the time, minute per day, spent on childcare activity during the same period, married women by the education of their wives. This is the same education of the women, and this is the time spent by the spouse, by the men. What we, and here we have different activities. We have primary activity and secondary activity. But it doesn't matter on which activity do we look at. Husbands of highly educated women with master degree and above do not spend more time at home raising kids and helping at home than husbands of women with bachelor degree. So we reject also the hypothesis of Husbands helping their wives raising kids which allow them to have larger families. What about the marriage markets? Here we have the marriage rate across different age groups for the same five educational groups. Less than high school, high school, some college, bachelor degree, and master and above. We don't see that women with master degree and above are more successful in preserving their marriage than women with bachelor degree. So this explanation that, or this hypothesis that, Highly educated women, master degree and above, are having more kids because they are more successful in preserving their marriage is not true, at least in the data. And the last hypothesis that I would like to reject is about the medical technology. Clearly, one may think that, yes, 100 years ago, we, we didn't have the medical technology we have today. Today, women at age 45, 48, they can give birth. Maybe this is the reason for why we observe today high fertility rates for highly educated women that they spend a lot of time getting education, and then they reach 
and invest in their career, and then they reach age 40 and decide to give birth. But we look at data from 1920 from the US. This is our data from 2000, 2011. What you see here is number of birth per 1,000 women. For the age group, for different age group, the black 35 to 39, the middle one 40 to 44, and the light gray 45 to 49. These are the records today, 2000 to 2011. And you can see the records in 1920. This also refute the hypothesis that it is the medical technologies that allow women today to have kids at older ages, while this was not true in the past. Because in the past, we have larger number of kids in the same age groups per 1,000 women. So, is this story about women's education or it's about income? There must be something about education, but the mechanism I describe about cost, childcare cost, the ability to purchase time from the market, it's about income, it's not about education. So, what happens if we try to see, to look at the same fertility variable across income groups, not across educational group? So here we divide the income distribution into 10 groups. We call it deciles. The first group is the poorest. This is the second poorest, etc., etc., up to the richest. So here are the rich, here are the poor, and of course in the middle. And you have two curves. The light gray is, corresponds to 1980, to the year 1980. And the black corresponds to the, to the year 2010 we see a similar change. While the relationship was negative in 1980, it is flat or you. If it's not you, it's a flat relationship. But the same evidence we see in this figure, here we don't see a lot of change. All the change we observe here for rich groups, for rich couples. Fertility among rich couples increased a lot for the richest decile from one child 0.80 to 2.66 children. What shall I do now? <laughs> this was not me. Okay. So here, there is an interesting concept which is called differential fertility. What is differential fertility? Is the gap between fertility of the rich and the poor. Historically, it was negative, as we saw, in 1980. But today, 2010, it's flat or U-shaped. And here we could ask the question, how does income inequality affect economic growth? What is the relationship? 
as we saw earlier, this is investment in children's education. But across the different income groups, one comes from the model, one comes from the data. So you can look at this as the actual data, the actual number. How do we measure here education? The probability to graduate college. So if you come from a richer family, you have higher probability to graduate college. And this is because the investment in children's education is higher for rich couples. Why it is higher for rich couples? Not only because they can send their kids to good schools, but they can buy time from the market and spend more time with their kids. So, the question... I want to go back. Why this pattern is important? Look here. This is the fertility in 1980. It tells us that if you look one generation ahead to the future, fewer kids come from rich families. Many kids come from poor families. These kids will be the workers, the adults in the future. However, if we look at the pattern in 2010, the picture is different. Many kids are coming from rich families. And these families are investing a lot in their children's education. And therefore, we could ask how inequality affect development through investment in education. Let me explain this again. If we increase inequality, what does it mean? It means that we will have more rich families and more poor families. These rich families will have now many kids because of this new pattern. And they will invest a lot in their children's education. So it may be the case that due to higher inequality, average education increases. And this is what we want to discover and quantify. So, we would like to answer the following question. What accounts for the rise in the high income fertility? Our hypothesis is again marketization, outsourcing, freeing our time by purchasing services from the market. But marketization Think of the childcare cost depends on inequality. The higher inequality is, the lower is the relative cost of these services. With a lower relative cost, we can purchase more. If we can purchase more, we can have more kids, we can have more time to invest in our kids' education, and maybe this will increase the average education in the economy. I'm not saying that we should be interested only in the average education in the economy. But clearly, this mechanism may cause an increase in the average education. So, what we do, again, we build a theoretical model. 
And we ask ourselves to what extent we can replicate the data by our model. So what we do, we look at wages in the same two years, 1980 and 2010. We see that women wage has increased a lot for the same 10 groups. What about men? There has been slight increase only for the top deciles, the richest two groups, but the rest is stable. So what we do, we take these wages and we try to answer the question, is, before this, is the change in wages responsible for producing this new pattern of fertility? As a preliminary step, we look at different states in the US. And we see a positive relationship between the change in relative wage of high-income high women, high-income women, the first two groups, the ninth and the tenth deciles. These are the richest two groups. The change in the relative wage relative to the workers of home production substitute, this is the childcare, the housekeeper, and all the services that we purchase from the market, and here the change in their fertility. What we see here, on average, in states where the growth in wages relative to the cost of childcare was higher, we observe larger growth in family size, which is consistent with the theory that the main driver is the cost of childcare services and other substitute that we purchase from the market. So here we have two lines, two curves in each figure. One corresponds to the model and the other one corresponds to the data. And what we can see here is that the model can produce the data very well, can replicate the data very well. Meaning, from a methodological point of view, that this is a model with which I can produce the data and I can learn other things about the behavior of these families. So, let me skip this. So, what we conclude, what we conclude is that rich women increase their fertility and labor supply when their ability to marketize increases. Thus, an increase in unskilled migration, lower wages in the childcare services sector, and increase both fertility and labor supply of local women. This effect can be differential. It is more for more educated women. And increased marketization of household work allows women both to enter occupations that demand high levels of effort and lowers the earning gap in those, between men and women, in those occupations. Another interesting thing that we learn from the model, that the average American family spent 31% of the lifetime income on kids, on raising and educating kids. The average fraction 
of household income spent on market substitute is 5%. So 5% of the lifetime income is spent on market goods in order to free our time. And the last thing that I would like to uh, show you here is that without any additional investment by parents, the probability to graduate college is 17%. And by investment in the 10th decile, by the larger investment, this increases to around 80 or slightly above 80 percent. Okay? Um, what about time? 15 minutes. Okay, so let me talk about policies. So, an important policy is the minimum wage policy. And the economic debate with regard to this policy is that, yes, if we increase the minimum wage, workers, unskilled workers, workers with low education, will get a higher wage. But maybe some of them will be fired because employers are not willing to employ the same quantity of labor with higher wages. But within our model, within our theoretical tools, we discovered another channel by which the minimum wage may affect these choices made by the family. So if we increase the minimum wage, the cost of the childcare services and the housekeeper and all these substitutes will increase. We found that a $1 increase in the minimum wage will increase the wage in the home production substitute sector by 0 0.58 of a dollar. This clearly will negatively affect the labor supply for highly educated women and will also negatively affect fertility, family size. So let me show you just the result of a hypothetical increase of the minimum wage from 7.25, which is currently in the US, to $15. These are the five income groups, and this would be fer their fertility from about 91% in the fifth decile, and here about 88%. So the impact of an increase in the minimum wage would be lower fertility especially for highly educated women who depend heavily on the market to raise their kids. But moreover, these women now need to spend more time at home to raise their kids. And here we see that a woman that already gave birth to the desired number of children will increase the time at home from about 13% to more than 20, 23, 23%. Let me skip this. This is just summarizing the result that I just discussed. I would like to talk about another important margin 
childlessness. Some women opt for career and they decide not to have kids. This is what's called childless. And childlessness rate among married women with a college degree is between 6 to 10 percent. And childlessness rate among married women with master degree and doctoral degree, 13 and 19 percent. What we argue that childlessness rate due to the same mechanism that child care services has become cheaper and cheaper, this childlessness rate should decline for those educated women. And this is exactly what we see here. This is childlessness rate for highly educated women, and this is childlessness rate for the rest. And what we see, we see convergence, that childlessness rate is becoming similar for both the groups. Um, sorting. As I discussed in the introduction, marriage is not random. And we choose specific characteristics in our spouse. So if I think from the point of view of a man, we can make the same analysis for a woman. But let's capture the story from the point of view of a man. A man prefer to marry a high earner than a low earner. But in the past, in the past, these highly educated women had fewer kids. So this man who wanted to marry an educated woman should be satisfied with a small family. But today, a highly educated woman can afford having larger families. And if fertility is a desire for a man, then we should observe that more educated men are marrying today educated women than in the past. And this is what we see. I will skip the figure. This is what we see in the data. Um, I can stop here, but I, 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 I still have, yeah? Okay. So, but this is not working anyway. <laughs> okay, so let me show you the figure. This is using US data. This is an interesting figure. This is gives you here the five educational group, less than high school, high school, some college, bachelor degree, and master. And this gives you for a wife the proportion of husbands with a similar educational group. So here we have 59.4% of wives with less than high school have husbands with the same education. If we look here, 51% of women with exactly high school have Husbands with similar education, exactly high school. And here, if we look at wife with a master degree, 65% of those wives have husbands with master degree and above. This is for the year, for the 70s, 1970 to 79. And here, how the same figure look like between 96 and 2005. And what we see just from looking at the colors that there are more, there is more similarity in terms of education of husbands and wives. In other words, couples are choosing partners with similar education. So we talked about this 
mechanism of marketization, outsourcing to the market, which enabled women to have larger families, work more, invest more in their children's education. Could we generalize this? This may be happening in many countries. I try to look at the data for Russia and to see whether we could see something similar. So first of all, this is the distribution of women's education in Russia, ages 25 to 50 as we did for the US data. And we made this for four categories. I cannot tell you in Russian, but the translation should be less than high school, high school, some college, and completed college. The impression, usually, that Russian, most or the majority of Russians are highly educated, but this picture tells slightly different story that there is a variation in education of Russian women age 25 to 50. So what about this relationship? Fertility across this educational group. We see something similar. At least we could say that highly educated women have slightly more kids than women with some college. And what about income levels? Here we have data only from 2006 till 2000. 17. And here in these figures, we could say that we have a negative relationship. Whether we look at the whole period or we look the whole period 2006 to 17 or sub periods 6 to 11 and 11 to 17, we see similar pattern. Okay? So it seems to be that rich families, if we look at the very short history of 11 years, the relationship is negative. But there is something interesting when we look at the last two years, two, three years, 2015 to 17, we do observe that rich richer families are opting for more and more kids. And it's like the relationship is becoming U or flat, similar to what we observe in the US data. That said, it doesn't mean that the reason is the same. Marketization may be part of the story, but it doesn't have to be. The one conclusion I can take that we have a desire to have more kids. And we do know some episodes in history where families were constrained because of poverty, were constrained from having the desired number of kids. And once these constraints were released, once we developed, once we have become richer, we started to have more kids. So these rich families and these educated women were constrained in the past and they couldn't have the desired number of children or the desired size of the family. But these constraints are changing by the development of the markets. 
and as a matter of fact, we are observing today that these rich families are opting for as many kids as the poor. In terms of uh, child care by mothers, this is the pattern. Educated women spend more time, but also their partners are spending more time in child care. <clears throat> Looking at inequality, <clears throat> I couldn't find any change within this short time period. Again, I have data between 2006 and 2017. But we divided the data into poor regions and rich regions. Here you see the wage of women in poor regions. You see a slight growth in all deciles except the last one. What about men? Also a slight increase in wages from 2006-8, 2015-17. What about rich regions? We don't see in rich regions any growth in wages for women and not for men. For that reason, my conclusion is that the story I told you about marketization and the change in marketization that applies to the US and seems to be very strong in the US, it doesn't seem to be working in the case of Russia. But still, we are observing a similar pattern in which richer families and more educated families are opting for larger uh, families or more kids. Labor supply, it's also different from the US experience. We don't see that more educated women are working more in terms of hours weekly hours. So, let me, okay, and this is another figure that I showed you for the US here for Russia about sorting, about who marries whom in terms of education. And clearly you see that very highly educated couples are marrying each others, okay? So, this is my presentation. Let me conclude in this slide. We discussed the role of women in economics and what choices are made by households. One of the major choices, fertility, and investment in children's education. And we saw how the market helped women, at least in the US, to have larger family, and even to free time to invest more in their children's education. This may affect policy in the future. If today, and if this will be the future, that the majority of kids will come from richer families, from highly educated parents, then immigration policy may change. Maybe immigration will not appear as a threat as it is today, or it has been in the past. More than that. When the majority of kids will come from the 
richer families. These richer families have more political power. If they have more political power, they may affect the policies with regard to children such as child support. So the, emergen, the emergence of this new pattern is important per se. And beyond that, it has far-reaching impact on development and on future policies. Thank you. Stop here. Okay, this is the time for questions. Um, hello, Mr. Zavi. My name is Sergei. Um, may I ask you a question about Israel? You said a lot about edu uh, highly educated regions and highly educated people who has a uh, lower number of children in the family. And um, as far as I know, in Israel, it should be vice versa or should be different. Do, do, my question is, do you analyze uh, Israel in um, comparison to the number of children in the families with a um, higher level of income and a lower level of income? Uh, does they look similar to the United States and maybe to the uh, Russian families? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an interesting question because um, when we started working on this project, we started from very simple examples that we had in our mind from Israel. We realized that few women doing PhD and having three kids or more and we asked ourselves, maybe this is a general thing. We looked at the data and we found it. So I didn't make the calculation for the whole country, but for part of the country, I saw the same pattern. I believe that this pattern also holds there. Hi, my name is Anna, and I would like to ask you why did you base your research on US and not like European countries? Mm -hmm. So, for example, like, well, I lived in the Netherlands last year, and there is a, yeah, a lot of uh, feminism, and uh, male, they work part time and they take care about their children like one day per week at least. It's like Daddy's Day and Mom's Day. Yeah. So, my question is why yes? Okay, okay thank you. Um, the answer is the data availability. So we have very rich data, and as I said, as I answered the previous question, the example we had in mind was in Israel, but the rich data we found is in the US. But when I presented this research in many countries, I always heard the sentence from some locals that saying, we are sure that this is what's going on here as well. So I believe that this is a general pattern. It might not be true for every single country, but I believe that this is general that, and, could, and could be found in many, many countries. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, did you try to compare information that you said with the level of influence of religion uh, to the social uh, life in the States? Say it again. Uh, did you try to uh, uh, look to the level of religiosity in the state? Uh, so whether, with... whether this pattern is affected by religious? Yes. Yes, we took that into consideration and uh, these information are cleaned in the data. So this, um, what you saw in the data is after taking care of religiosity and differences in religiosity. 
this is more a technical and econometric question. We can talk about it later if you want. There, Dasha. There's a question. Uh, now for the question. Mm. Uh, you may say that you are a wrong person to ask, uh, but still, and given the fact, of course, that you, ha you have learned too little about the Russian situation, but again, uh, what may be the policy recommendations uh, for the authorities in a country like Russia, given the pattern you have discovered, because thus far, as far as I understand, the only thing that they're trying to do is distributing the so-called maternity capital, and this is where it stops. So, what may be the de demographical policy of the uh, of this of the state of the government? Again, given the pa the pattern you talked to us, to us about. Thank you. Okay, but let me just clarify for your question. Um, recommendation in order to to have what? So, can you can you clarify your question? The rec recommendation. Sure. In short, what are the policy implications for the government, given the pattern in the um, given the new shape of the curve that you have showed us? Okay, okay, and thank you. In general, the policy that is uh, implied by uh, this research is that there is a desire, we learned that there is a desire to have more kids, especially for rich and educated women. These women were constrained. What we saw in the U.S. that because of the increase in inequality and because the child care services sector has become cheaper, they could have more kids and invest more in their education. Now, in terms of what is going on in Russia, what we saw here is already an increase in fertility among the rich families. So I, I don't know the mechanism, and I don't think that the mechanism is similar to the one of the US. So I don't see any policy here that we need to think about in order to increase fertility, which is already started to increase in general in general, in places where we observe that fertility is lower than desired, the direct policy is to make childcare services cheaper. And this could be achieved either by subsidy or by inflow of immigrants, which both can affect the price of these sectors. Uh, good evening. My name is Veronica and my question is how did you manage to collect this data, especially if we are talking about Russia? What instruments did you use and how many people uh, did participate in this survey? Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, data, we use the RLMS, the Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey, which is a, a rich data set. And uh, I had an assistant helping me in just replicating. It was not a very difficult uh, mission because I just wanted to replicate what I produced in the previous paper. How many people participate? They participate. So, the, the, the sample here, the sample size. Um, good question. I, I, I don't, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, 
my question is, uh, did you do any forecasts uh, about how this new trend will change uh, the market of outsourcing uh, all that stuff that uh, born this trend. So it looks like uh, there will be more people who would like to outsource and less people who can outsource it for them. We didn't make such a calculation, but as long as inequality persists, you will always find people who demand these services and poor people who are willing to supply these services. But we didn't make these predictions. Because it looks like the cost will, will raise. And uh, you, you said that uh, the, if uh, the cost of that uh, services will raise, if minimum wage will raise, uh, it will burn new trends. Yeah, but, but what, what we see in the data is already a result of demand and supply and this is the final outcome that we have this quantity of purchased child care. So this is, is already taken into consideration. Yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Alexey Raksha and I've got uh, at least a question, questions to you. Uh, first, um, you mentioned that uh, in modern times, uh, fertility of rich people increased, have increased, and they bear more children, and they could probably have more political power because of that in the future. So uh, does it mean that uh, uh, your construction that you have discovered means that it's uh, some kind of uh, self-sustainable process of continuing diversion of social uh, social fabric. I mean, uh, it's, uh, the gap between rich and poor could become uh, even bigger in America by that mechanism as a part of it. And the first question, and the second question, can you uh, link the uh, recent fall of Mexican immigration and, okay, uh, to, uh, in a whole uh, Lat Lat Latin American immigration to the United States with the falling fertility rates? in the past decade after the Great Recession. Repeat the second one, please. The sec second question? Yeah. Do, can you link uh, uh, falling um, in migration rates of Latin Americans into the United States with the post-recession uh, fertility falling, which, which can, uh, continues uh, till that time? Okay, so thank you. So regarding the first question, it doesn't have to be the case of this persistence of segregations between the two groups of family, the rich and the poor. I meant exactly the opposite. It may be the case that once the rich who have more political power have more kids, they will be more supportive of policies that are generous for kids in general and the poor may enjoy having these policies as well. It's a questionable hypothesis. Sorry? <laughs> it's a rather questionable hypothesis. No, uh, this, is, this is a hypothesis that may be in the future when we will see many kids coming from rich families who have strong political power. Okay, this is a hypothesis. And regarding the second question, uh, the mechanism that we have predicts that once the immigration declines, these services should be more expensive. And if these services would be more expensive, it may affect labor supply and fertility of rich women as the theory predicts, but in terms of quantity, I cannot say anything now about the quantity. But the qualitative result is as predicted by the theory. It could be negative on labor supply and fertility of rich American native women. 
seems quantity also get down. I'm, I'm saying quantitatively we need another tool in order to say by how much this may affect. This is what I meant by quantity. Now, you have to choose this question. Um, we have a book to present. Okay, so um, actually uh, the first question was by the policy. I will give the book to the gentleman. Then we'd make a picture. By the way, all questions were great. Okay. Thank you.